Hey, everybody. Uh, okay. We're live. It's TGIK. And um, so today, Duffy is here. He's my friend, and uh, he's over from Isovalent. And so, like, we're real excited to have Duffy. And uh, Nishad is my friend from VMware. And, of course, I'm Jay. So we're – I mean, I guess we're just going to get started. The week in review, there's – I don't really have much here. Um so uh, maybe we can dig up some other news while we get started um, and uh, see. Well, you know, actually, I have one other thing um, because uh, we have this Kubernetes on Windows book that just came out. So <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of do a shameless plug for that. So this is I just this. So I'll do I'll do I'll do a plug for that right right at the end of this. But let's first get started with like the week in review here. Um, so let me make sure I'm, Hey, what's up, Ricardo? Yeah, we do have Duffy and Nishad. <laughs> yes, we have Hello. Duffy and Nishad. Um, what's up, Ibrahim? Yeah, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm fired now. So exactly. Like, I don't know how all this stuff works. Duffy's going to show us. So what? Um, <laughs> you totally know how this stuff works. <laughs> So uh, yeah, let's see. Okay, so let's let's first look at this um, this issue. I, I was like, well, I don't know what I didn't know for the week in review. I was like, well, this seems like a really cool, interesting thing. There's a one dot two two regression. Have you heard of this, Duffy? One, I haven't. Let's see. Have you seen this? Evidently, face. there's a there's a regression in one dot two two. Yeah, this is cool. So if you create a evidently, if you create a static pod. Um, we can actually do this as our first thing that we do today. So let's actually, let's put this down in the notes here. Let's like, we'll try to reproduce this. So yeah. Um, oh, that's a big one. That's a big one for QBADM. Cause it would break, it would break the upgrade case since QBDM uses a lot of static containers. So that would be kind of, kind of a big deal. Delete. Yeah, what, where, well, where does it? I'm just looking at this the first. So if we, you start it, okay, add a static pod minute, observe the pod, remove and recreate the pod manifest, observe the pod. But I think though, you're recreating the pod manifest. Does it have to be identical? What if you create a new pod, pod manifest? Because doesn't the Kube ADM yeah. make a new pod manifest on an upgrade? I think it typically just replaces the one that is ex exists, right? So if you're going to do an upgrade of like, yeah, it's basically going to change. I mean, typically the only change is in the is in the image URL, right? So yeah. like, all we're really changing is like the version of the thing you're running. All of the parameters, all of the rest of the parameters remain the same. Okay. Okay. Cool. So then, if you so I okay so so it's so this is specific to like you rewriting the exact same manifest, I guess. Hmm. So anyways, yeah, this was an interesting regression. I thought I'd bring it up because today we're going to be talking about pods. And so um, now this, like, I think, hey, what's up, Rajas? What's up, Juka? Um, what, 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 what's up, everybody? What time is it in India right now, Rajas? Um, let's see here. This is likely to be caused by the pod cleanup being keyed by UID and not handling overlapping. So, okay. We can dig more into that later if, if folks want to. Now, this is a, we're real flexible in what we do here today. Um, so, you know, if folks want to dig into something else uh, that's related to pods and the kublet and all that, like we're happy to, right? Um, if you have any stuff you want to look at. So uh, this is something else that's it's exciting to me. We have, uh, we have experimenting with Windows CNI in a pod. Um, so now we've got the ability to run host process containers as of 1.22 in, in alpha for, for windows. So this allows you to run like your CNI on windows and so on and so forth. So this is a blog sort of hack MD by Perry that he wrote up that shows how to do that. So that's some more news. Um, and then, uh, what else? Any other news? Oh, you got EBPF summit. So we'll do that next. Cool. Okay. Um, no more Windows news. We I got a book that just came out, Kubernetes on Windows. So you don't have That's to go awesome. buy my book. 
but <laughs> but if you want you can but i think you can click on these and manning will let you like learn learn a bunch of like it goes through antria and open v switch in depth um and all that so yeah if you want to really learn how the internals of kubernetes on windows work like that's that's kind of probably the only way that i can think of that i know of at least <laughs> um, probably the most concise for sure yeah yeah, like most of the other ones that I think that are out there are are more for application developers. They're not like deep in the Kubernetes internals. So, um, yeah. EBPF Summit, this, what's going on with this stuff? So this actually, we just held we held this week before last, and it's a, an incredible two day summit. And the recording links are right there. So you go to live stream day one, live stream day two. This was an EBPF summit that like talks about all things EBPF. And so if you're interested in learning more about EBPF or um, Cilium or what I've been working on lately or any of that stuff, then definitely go check out those two streams. There's lots of great content in there. We also did um, a CTF that was hosted by Tabitha Sable, and we had lots of great speakers like yeah, like Yana Dogan and uh, um, Brendan and Brendan and everybody. It was really an incredible experience. So super fun. Cool. Hi, Sevi. Hey, what's up, Sevi? What's up, Amim? Sevi, KRKR4. Hi, Sevi. You're from Istanbul. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know we had people from Istanbul coming. It's 1.30 in India. EJK is worldwide. Yeah. Rajas is up at 1.30. Oh. Uh, Ricardo, he went to EBPF Summit. So um, what's the latest in EBPF, Duff? What can you tell us? I mean, there's what's tons the of latest stuff thing y'all are working on? <laughs> yeah. Um, like on the I mean, Cilium end, what's going in there that's yeah. new? On the Cilium side, like some of the fun stuff is like in um, handling, you know, there's been a lot of code changes in the EPF code base, like, you know, introducing things like NetNS cookie and you know, the ability to actually understand where a packet is um, sourcing from so we can make better routing decisions for those packets, mm -hmm. even if it's, um, e even in the, in the case where we're doing th things like replacing kubeproxy and just using EPF to handle all of the routing. And so like that's some of the changes that are, that are happening and like it's interesting because like some of those changes are are um inside of the code base for like kernels after like 5.4 so like 5.7 and up have those changes but lots of things happening in, inside the space we've been working on a lot of really exciting things at cilium and we're and we're hiring there's you know tons of stuff happening cool if anybody wants to go work on cilium you know just go find mm -hmm. find duffy what um you know how to, you know how to find me What's your Twitter handle, Duffy? Maui Lion, M-A-U-I-L-I-O-N. Well, that's what it is, Maui Lion. Lion. I yep. thought it was like, Mal there's not two L's, there's one L. Okay, I think cool. it's like French or, people think it's French or something. I think the first time Joe said it, he was like, Mawillion. And I'm like, yeah. what is, what is <laughs> a Mawillion? Why, why I, would anybody I, think that Maui Lion is a word of like, it's fair. Stop. Yeah. What's up, Coke Jen? Yusuf. Philip. Okay. Um, so does anybody have any topics in the whole pod kublet pod space that you want to look into um, before we start looking at stuff? Um, Nishad, is there any news you want to tell us about? Uh, nah. <laughs> so so let me give you a little backstory about how Nishad ended up here today. Um, so we were, where's, where is it? This is the part where I have all these tabs and I don't know what to do with them. Oh, Nishad. But, but that's every day. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. So Nishad was, um, so Nishad, why don't you, why don't you tell me about that weird thing that you were trying to do the other day? Um, and tell us about your problem. Oh, that okay. you ran into. I mean, we have an internal like, CI system to, to, to context set. We have an internal CI system that uses Docker to do stuff. Now that's the starting point. So go ahead from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, long and short is we currently deploy everything on the. Uh, I basically wanted to move our system over to running onto pods. And we've been hit at, it's been running fine for the most part. But the problem is right now when we drain, uh, those pods, we run into an issue of, oh, actually, I should go step back a second. So the, what happens is we basically deploy a pod, and inside those pods, we have two containers, and maybe something more, I don't actually remember. We have uh, 
a Docker daemon, uh, full Docker daemon with its own socket process, everything. Uh, and we have a Celery worker process uh, that mm -hmm. just accepts requests and then uses Docker to process things for you. So the boundary here is we have a single pod and inside of that pod, you've got, all right, now let me get, let me get a different color here. Okay. And so you're running this in like a VM somewhere, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a VM and it's running somewhere and we've got, we got a K8 API server out here. Mm -hmm. So it's in a, it's in a cluster and you have, okay. So what's running in here? What's inside this red stuff? Wait, you got sorry. the Docker daemon, and then what's the other thing? Celery. So if you've not heard okay. of Celery before, I mean, it's, it's like it's a, a test runner. Uh, yeah, sort of. It's like an async task queue for Python, basically. Yeah. Okay. And so this thing's running random tasks that people to tell it to do. Like, what's an example of one of those? Um, I, I don't know. One of them might be to spin up a Kubernetes cluster, for example. Uh, it, or do some like run some health checks or things like that. Okay, yeah, because this is for CI, right? So like think of it that way. I know this sounds. People are like, why are you creating a Docker container to that tells it? But the reason is because like you know for CI jobs, you might want to have multiple containers that go off and create virtual environments and all sorts of other things for developers. That's this is not an uncommon problem. It's not just a problem that cloud companies have, right? So yeah, okay. Um, we basically take user workloads and run them in containers. Should I make this green celery? Okay. I'll make that one green. So you have two processes. So who can tell the diagram not too clear? Is it because it's is it because it's too little or is it because it's just ugly? <laughs> Cause like, you know, I can make it bigger. I think someone else will have to draw it to make it less ugly. Yeah, <laughs> let's make it bigger. Let's 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 do it right. It's Friday. We're gonna do things right. Mm -hmm. No more of these so, ugly. So nobody said so nobody ever. <laughs> there was no more, no more Nishad. No more of these rough shod. Let's make a big boundary for this pod and then let's put two containers big yellow circles on the inside how's that is that looking better kr kr mm -hmm. it's friday both <laughs> the meme says both okay well this is i think this is better but y'all can let me know celery is in the middle here okay and then we've got a docker daemon right so and then you're so these are both these are both processes inside of your container. LGTM. Thank you, Choco. What's up, Choco? Um, hey, oh, brighter. Can I make it brighter? Maybe it's a little brighter now. Oh, the red was what he wasn't working for him. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So, um, all right. So Docker. So, so, all right. So inside of this, we were just talking about this, but we hadn't really finished thinking about it. So I've got a VM. And as far as the VM is concerned, you know, we could sort of start exploring this right now, right? Because I, I just made a kind cluster. Mm -hmm. So you can docker exec dash t dash i into one of these, right? Um, and so like if we look at the if we look at the what's going on in here, if I do ps dash ax, right, I've got PID one in my in my this is essentially we're like here right now, right? We're at the Sorry, I lost the diagram. We're here right now, right? We're we're here and we're looking here. We've got like PID1 and that's this right here, this S bin in it, right? So if I go to PID1 in here, my VM is saying this is the init process. So what does the init process do? Like what does the init process just start system D? Like what else does it do no. other than that? Okay, what is what all does it do? Where, are you looking inside of the, um, what are we looking at I, here? Okay. I'm inside so of a Docker the, container. Okay. But so this is a I kind mean, container and it's a very special, uh, a very special uh, container because we're kind of overloading the whole definition of containers in this model, right? Yeah. Where for the most part, vast majority of the cases, you would never run system D inside of a container. 
it's just not a thing. Yeah. You would you would maybe like have your Go process or your binary or whatever it is, and you would actually have that be PID one, and it would run inside your container. And fancy cases, you might have like some dumb init or or um, a init process that will handle a sync up that gets sent by the kubelet when you're ready to kill a, a container. Okay. Um, and that would handle like cleaning and reaping out all the other processes that might be running inside that container. But in Kind's case, we're actually running a bunch of Docker containers that each have a containerd binary and their own containerd running. And because we need this to look like regular system stuff for like testing, <laughs> we yeah. are running systemd in there. But if you were to do a yeah. Docker inspect, you'd realize that like there's all kinds of stuff we have to do to get systemd to even start inside of a container. We have to mount. Uh, or like the particular paths we have to mount, it has to be running as privileged. There's all kinds of wacky stuff that we have to do. Yeah, so this is a weird, yeah, case. these are really, I, I didn't really mention this. So is everybody familiar with kind? I kind of, I think we're kind of skipping ahead here. Um, do That's folks, fair. do folks, everybody know what kind is? I didn't think about that. I, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you, you mentioned that Duffy. I'm assuming everybody's like kind of familiar with kind and stuff. But yeah, we sort of live kind, so it, it's sort of we live in that world. Let's assume they are until folks tell us otherwise. Like, so yeah, go, so I have a maybe we should just get into a VM and actually compare it. So, um, so Choco is like, yeah, so let's maybe we should just because Nishad gave me a private key to another VM that we have. This is in what Azure Nishad. Mm -hmm. And then let me get into another. Okay. Did you give me the IP address of this thing? 20.whatever? Yeah. whatever. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Okay, so I can SSH mod 600 nishad.pem SSH. I'm doing this in another terminal in case I have to edit this pem and I don't want to get in trouble for being Nishad's stuff on the internet. Oh, oh no, it deleted. SSH Ubuntu. Ubuntu, here we go. Oh, wait. Oh, dash I. Nishad, give me a second. I'm coming. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. I'm in. All right. So here's another VM. So, like, if we were to go over here. Okay. So, if I was to go, I'm going to become root, right? And I can do PSSA. Because now we can actually look at actual real processes in a real VM. So, let's see. What's the, so let's look at what Duffy was just talking about. So if it, okay, so so this is what a real computer does. <laughs> yeah. So what are all these things in brackets? Those are running processes. Most of the time, what? like the stuff in brackets is going to be it's going to be stuff that you're like measuring that's part of the um, uh, the kernel code. It's not necessarily programs that you're running, but so like see net NS and like task stuff. So this is like, you could think of it almost like background processes that are part of the, um, the, the kernel oh, that you're operating. Okay. Okay. So everything in brackets is like a, it's like, it's like the, it's like the kernel is making it and it's giving it its own special name and it puts it in brackets. The other stuff you know, is like when you're, yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say like when you're in Windows and you have like all of that other crazy stuff that's happening that isn't any of your applications. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 the stuff in brackets. Okay. Oh, so cool. Are <laughs> yeah. yeah. There are things the kernel's doing and it says I'm gonna put okay, cool. So I could name a process bracket and then trick people into thinking it was a kernel task. Yes, you could. Although you oh. I think well. It'd probably be a little tricky because, <laughs> okay. because like as you can see with the rest of these processes right like you'd have to start it in a way that the path to that process would resolve to what you'd want the name to be i think there might be there might be a way to get around it but it'd be kind can of I, interesting to... can i make a <laughs> can i do this <laughs> uh, what how would this work would you do like this okay yeah like sleep it's like bin bash sleep forever or something and I think he would still oh, yeah, see the task to it because I think it's being handled differently because it is a kernel task rather than running inside of a user space, user space tax. But you could do things, you could do something like, you know, make an alias for run SV. 
But if I do it, can I do it? Do back I, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what if I do it? Okay. Well, I was able to run it. Okay. Can it, did you put Tmox on here in a shot? You did. Oh, I did. You're my, oh, good. You're my friend. You're my, now, now we can oh, be oh, friends. Oh, I did. You, this is all now it takes we, to be friend. <laughs> Wait, where is it? Did it work? Uh, PS dash AX. Can we? Does it mean we can file a CVE, Duffy? If we swear. Oh no, <laughs> it ran in bash. Yeah. So I'd have to make it an executable, huh? Mm -hmm. Somehow. Yeah, you could like compile a dumb little go binary or something. Like that, <laughs> but but even okay. then, you'd still have to make it. I think he would still be. He would still have a pass in front of it, so I don't think it would work. Okay. All right. I'm pretty sure impersonating the kernel that way would trigger something. Okay. So we can't trick. But the, not that any of that matters. It's not why we're here. No. <laughs> so, okay. No. So, anyways, so we're PID, PID 1 now in a real computer. We've got all these kernel tasks, and those are like PID 1 through whatever, 1 through 700 or something like that. It's got all these other things. And then after that, we've got a whole bunch of other processes. Here's, oh, here's Chrome. Here's the. NTP thing, right? So, okay, we all know what a lot of this stuff is. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, we start seeing some stuff that's like that, that's Kubernetes ish. So, so where does systemd go on here? Oh, yeah. Sys First one, PID one. PID one. Well, PID one is S bin and it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is effectively systemd. That's effectively systemd. Okay, I didn't know that. All right, so s bin and it winds up starting systemd. I, I didn't. Okay, so so if you're looking, okay, and then so then these there here are some other things that are presumably we could ps tree this. What are we doing? Why didn't we just do that? Right. So okay, there we go. So now we can see systemd is what's spawning all of these, right? <clears throat> So um, these are the processes that are running in a normal VN. Now, if I was to go in here, oh, I don't have it. So I have to do a, what do I have to do, APK update this? Well, if you're inside, if you're, uh, just do PS minus E space F. I know it sounds weird. I got you. Oh, that kind of gives you, oh yeah, you kind of, so okay. <laughs> That's nice. I didn't know you could do that. This is the weirdest thing. I remember like discovering it one day and going like, wait, what? Like, but it totally works and it's P portable. And it's PS like, dash yeah. E. This is cool. Okay. So you don't need PS tree. You could just do P dash E F and you'll get a tree of all the process. All right, cool. Um, okay. So does, so, so let's look in here, like what's going on. So we've got, we've got a pause container running. We got another pause container running. We've got kube proxy. It's running as a privileged uh, as a privileged pod, um, and then we've got another. We've got this container d shim, and then that's the parent of like this pause. And is that so? Does that mean this is also a parent of this down here? This runs vdir. Yes, thing? that's right. Yep. Okay. The so of all that stuff. Yeah. So if you're if we wanted to say like what is a pod actually doing, right? We can look in here and we could see it's. This container D shim process, and it's running. It's got two children, and each of the children, as far as it's concerned, these have different yeah. PIDs. Yeah, th this is an interesting thing. I'll, I'll just jump in. I'll interject for one okay. second here. Please do. So when we look, when we look at that, like the container D shim runs C piece, right? Because we're running inside of Kubernetes, we get this infrastructure container for free, and the infrastructure container is referred to as a pos container. And that pause container holds namespaces that we will share with any other container that is within the pod. In Docker, typically you would only have like the container and all of the namespaces that it's associated with. But inside of Kubernetes, you'll have a pod, which means that every container within that pod will share the same network namespace. It will share this. It can share the same host uh, PID namespace. It can share the same. Uh, um, a bunch of different other namespaces that it can share, but it's by default going to share the same network namespace. And so for that trick to work, we need to have some place to hold it, right? 
So we have to hold that network namespace in the pods container, and then any subsequent container that is part of that pod, we're just going to bind mount, if you will, into the network namespace associated with that pods container. Yeah. So, and that's just to hold it open, right? It's because of the yeah. way net IP net, because of the way network namespaces work in Linux. Even you, you could even just say the way that containers work, right? If a container is a running process. As soon as that container, as soon as that process stops, the container stops. So what we do in Kubernetes is we make it so that that running process is that pause binary. And we start you, everything you else. Could, couldn't you imagine a world where you built a container namespace before you actually built the container? And but to in the Linux kernel and, it, and the namespace. Was yeah, I think Windows is kind of. I think Windows could be like that because it's so weird and it's so different. Yeah. Like I'm not sure if it is yet, but um, you wrote the book, man. Ain't nobody else more sure than you. The pause container on Windows always confuses me, right? Like Fair. I feel like the HCS shim API. I feel like there seems like there would be a way you could. You because it's like a separate API thing, right? It's like its own, it's not like a Linux in Linux, like you know, it's the well, the all processes all the and the namespaces doing, are all mixed together, right? Think about the shim process is really just responsible for like for um doing the heavy lifting of like figuring out based on the configuration that you've passed it, like at the Docker command line or whatever, like yeah. what what namespaces to associate with this particular process that you created. So if you have a if you do Docker run bash, uh, then what will happen is that it will assume, Docker will assume based on those parameters that it will create a new container based on the file system that it pulls down for that image and it will give it its own network namespace. It will give it its own PID namespace. It will give it its yeah. own file system view. It won't mount any volumes. It won't do anything else like that. And it will live for the period of time that whatever the init process within that container runs. As soon as yeah. that bash process exits, all of those namespaces are recycled. They're not yeah, there they're anymore. All yeah. So, and so then we have, okay, so in here, so that was a really good explanation of what, why we have that Linux pause image if people are wondering then. So and there's yeah, one more on. piece of it that I wanted to talk about real quick, because I think it is helpful also. You see on line uh, where it says 1478, user yeah. local bin run serve run the SV dear dash p yeah that's an init process so that is kind of like the container equivalent of system d oh so that's what runs okay so in this case what it's doing is it's actually just going to start presumably some long running services that have okay. been defined in files underneath etsy service Enabled, and you can take an executive that container and look at those if you wanted to. But where's run s sphere dear? <laughs> where's that coming from? I've never heard of that before. That's packaged inside the container, and that's just one of the many examples of like a container init that you can run. This is actually, I think this comes initially from Alpine or something like that, but I, I think it's like the built in init process that, um, that comes with a bunch of different containers, including this one. Okay, so this is built. So this is like built into the kernel that we use when we build a container. No, this is built on the file system. It's a binary running on the file system that we're calling when we start the container. So if you look at the, if you look at the, if you do a Docker inspect of this container, okay. or a Sierra kettle inspect of this container, then you'll see that like the the run command or whatever, like the 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 command that's running when you start the container up, Docker run would be user local bin run svdir dash p etsy service enabled. And That's it's your like, command, okay. your CMD. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So is this whole thing based on um, Alpine, then? I believe it came from Alpine, if I remember correctly. Um, like, we would I have think to, that's yeah. Runs, yeah. I, okay. I don't remember exactly, but. And then these wind up being children of that. Because that's an init process. Just like yeah. if you were to look at your system and you do PS minus CF on the bigger box, you're going to see like your, you know, S bin init, and then everything else is a child of that. Same thing, right? Run SV dear 
is the init yeah. process and it will uh, become the parent of any long running processes defined within that services directory. Oh, so maybe they built this because of that zombie problem we used to have, right? Like in oh, the yeah. early days. Yep. So this, before yeah. early days, they didn't have this, right? Nope. Yeah. Okay, now I'm starting. I kind of remember. Okay. I remember the problem that this solves, even though I don't remember this thing. So where does run <laughs> C fit in? Where does run C happening? Run C is, uh, you could think of it as like the, the um, so the shim has, when you, so, oh, this is going to be complex, but let's give it a try. Okay. So if I do Docker run bash, right? Okay. Docker run bash is actually um, going to the, is a consumer of container D these days. Okay. So yeah. Docker run bash is sort of kind of a translated version of CTR run container, but it's, yeah. it's mapped to an API that people are used to in Docker. So if you yeah. could, you could get the same container running just by using CTR commands against the container D socket as you could yeah. using Docker run commands against the Docker socket. So yeah. Docker is a consumer of container D. Yeah. We're, we're so far we're to the container D part. Container yeah. D is flexible in the runtimes that it uses. And you can configure yes. those runtimes in Etsy systemd daemon or uh, Etsy docker daemon.conf. You can like, introduce different container runtimes that you want. Yep. Um, by I default, got you though, to talk about Windows. It's like you're almost uh, there. By default, though, the way that um, the runtime is configured on Linux is that the, the runtime that you're using is, um, is that, uh, they call it that run C binary. So if you were to do, yeah. if you're on that underlying node, type run C space dash dash version. Okay. Let's get so on, on the root, node. Root. Yeah, right there. Yep. Run C dash dash version. Yeah. So this is a binary that is responsible for doing all of the heavy lifting of instantiating the containers, handling the the volume mounts and all that other stuff, and making it and making your container process a real process. Yeah. Container D and Docker are both kind of like the keepers of those processes that run C creates. Yeah. The way yeah, that the so shim process works is even more complex because the container D shim process is, is like effectively like a process that holds the resulting process that run C started. That's why you don't see run C in here because the run C process started it. <laughs> And yeah. Then, like, and then kind of held it, and, and then the container D shim holds as a parent in the underlying system for those processes that are running inside of that now Wait, containerized so, process. So run C started wow. the shim. Yes. No. But the then shim, the shim used run C to create the processes or just to initialize the processes that were defined within that container. Oh, okay. So container D doesn't actually. Didn't and it initialized these processes. So, so this is kind of like container D isn't the thing that actually runs run C. It's actually the shim. <laughs> it's the container D shim that runs run C. Container D, when you say Docker run, will actually make a call to run C to create these things, but it will give as a parent process this shim. It gives it back. Okay. So it gives a different it, thing back. Okay. Yeah. And it's doing that yeah, because. This solves another problem that you might remember. The problem was that, and it's still true to this day, actually. If you run Docker on your system and you restart yeah. the Docker daemon, what happened to all of your containers? They die, right? Yeah. Should we just do because, that? Let's just let's restart them and ooh, well, I don't know. We'll definitely see them right. die. What? Right. <laughs> what? Yeah. I don't know. What's the worst that could Bye -bye. happen, right? Okay. See you. So we definitely know. All right, so they're all gone. <laughs> All right. I think your idea. I think you just restart the VM. Yeah, I, I, we lost everything. Oh, what? what? I Did restarted restart the VM. Docker? Yeah, Docker yeah. Mac is a VM. On your deck, on your Docker desktop. Yep. You might want to do this on the other on the, if you SSH into the other guy. I can't do it here because I don't have a. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't really count. We need to do it here. Mm -hmm. System CTL restart Docker. Um, wait. 
Oh, it's called Docker D. Yeah. Yeah. What? One thing. Let me go SHNZ. Can you do Docker PS? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just Docker. System CTL status. Let's see if Nishad installed Docker on this properly. Okay. Oh, Docker D dot system C CTL restart. Oh, it's a snap process. Oh, the answer might... is no. He did not install it properly. You, you did it he with the snap process. <laughs> can, can you snap restart stuff in snap? Yeah, I think you can, like snap kettle or something. But you should also be able to do it with. Uh... Yeah, Eric Eric mentioned it. He's like, yeah, bounce to the VM. I wasn't thinking about that. So um, run. Okay. It should, it should be back up. Oh, wait. Carl no, your doctor complaining about something. Hey, what's up, Carlos? I'm like scrolling through all the comments while we figure this Ooh. out. What's up, Faye? Right. Okay. <laughs> So, um, Faye, it's good to see you. Faye is my favorite, like, release engineer in the whole world. Um, okay. okay. So, uh, he's over here at VMware. He, he's, the, he's in charge of getting Tanzu out the door, and he's been working hard lately. Thank you, Thank Faye. Hey, yes. So, um, okay, where were we? Sorry, I just got all – I got Does all – You, have you run anything on here, Ishad? I only run uh, cluster create. So I've... Let's see. I don't think there should be anything running right now. So that's it. Okay, but you did run something. Okay. No, but it's not. Yeah, nothing running right now. Um, we could just install Kind, right? Do we have Kind on here? Um, okay, I can just install Kind. Yeah. It takes like two seconds. Kind install. Okay. You know, like I was just telling people, it was like, okay, here we go. I'm grabbing it over here. Here we go. Move kind user local bin. All right. Okay. So let's do kind create cluster. Right, here we go. All right, so we're installing kind on the VM so we could then run this experiment on an actual computer. I, I so we've kind of gone off in the weeds here, <laughs> haven't we? So, um, so anyways, this is really cool. So anyways, this is like a little. This is just like a little burrito, that the container D gives to gives you to after it starts this process downstream from run scene, it gives you back whatever that shim is to the kernel. So yeah. um, I don't know what happened so to my kind. Yeah. So where I was headed with that was if you yeah. do doc, if you do restart the Docker process, yeah. what ends up happening is that all of your, um, all of those shims die. And that was a little weird for a while because we were like, well, like, why should those shims die if we do an upgrade of like Docker? Yeah. Maybe we don't want the shims to die when we do that. What can we do instead? Um, and that's where the whole idea of shims came along was like, well, if we made it so that we were able to disconnect the running container from the parent process of Docker, then we would be able to upgrade Docker and not worry about having to restart every process that's running inside of a container. Yeah. And that is a configurable thing in Docker, but it's not the default. That's still, so like if you're using Docker at all, that's the thing that you can actually set in your Docker, docker-daemon.com or whatever, your docker daemon conf. That will allow you to like make it so that you can restart the Docker daemon and all of those shims will continue to be running happily in the background. And when you restore, and when you restart the Docker daemon, It'll just replumb all of those shims, and you'll still be able to do Docker run, Docker exec, Docker PS, all that stuff will work. Okay, where do I find my Etsy Docker Damon oh. I think is the question. I How think many cores? Hey, Nishad, does this machine have? Uh... I feel like it's kind of getting tired. I can't tell though. Maybe. Okay. Tell. All right. 
it's got enough to make this work because otherwise TKG wouldn't launch. <laughs> Damon.json. Where is it? Did I spell it wrong? Oh, you're spinning up a three node cluster, though. I don't know if that'll work. Oh, did I? Why did I spin up a three node cluster? It did come up. I just don't think we could do anything else. Oh, I guess Snap hides it away in here. So yeah. uh, that's weird. May, may I recommend the use of git.docker.io? Mm -hmm. Git.docker.io. Okay, let me put that way in the show cleaner notes. way. Way cleaner way it's, of installing, and actually, like it, it follows whatever the distribution you're in. So if you're on like Ubuntu or Debian or Red Hat or whatever, you're, if you do like get.docker.io slash type or pipe sudo bash, I know I I hate to recommend that, but like if you don't want to do it properly, like you just want to do it quickly, this is a great way to do it. Wait, I think you meant get, not git. Get. I did. Docker. I did mean get. Yeah. yeah. It's like one of those things that you just do from the curl from the internet. Okay. From now yeah. on, Nishad, here's your, here's some, you get the latest, some, you get the latest stable <laughs> Docker. It's mm -hmm. really nice. Um, okay. So what was the configuration parameter that you were mentioning? Sorry, I was jumping around looking at notes and stuff. Um, live, what were you just live restore. Okay. Live restore. Yeah. Let me, let me pull up the link for it here. Like that, and I can do true. It's like a boolean. What is it? Let me dig Let's it up. Let's do it right here. Live I'll restore. Put it in the chat. Locker. Why is it not on my default? It is not on my default. Live versus. Is it, I think it's. I'm just assuming it's. I don't know what this is, but it must just be a boolean. I can't think it. I can't oh, imagine. Oh, it is not supported else. in Windows. Boom. It is oh. a. It is a boolean, but you have to do live restore colon true that right yep, you got it yep. comma okay all right so all right that's that yeah, okay yeah. how do i test that it's working so i've got first first you want to do system ctl daemon reload daemon dash reload wait wait would that restart the snap process though no it'll just basically reload the configuration files of stuff make sure yeah. that those configuration files are fresh in system b okay. and then i I think so. This is not so. Docker daemon is usually still being managed by systemd, even if it's installed by Snap. I think, unless it's only, it might be like Snap CTL that we need. Yes, I said burrito. Sorry. <laughs> okay, it might be Snap CTL. Oh, Chuckle Arch. I love it. <laughs> Just use Arch Pacman s Docker. We just we're not that fortunate today to have Arch Linux. You know, so if Duffy just, was running the show, it probably would have been the case. We just have an Arch Linux box. Okay. True. Yeah. Um that, lately anyway. Before it was about to do snap CTL a dash dash help. Do snap CTL dash dash get maybe. No, Klein doesn't depend on on Docker Desktop, Conrad. That's a good question. Well, it does on Mac and Linux. Oh, Mac and Windows. Oh, services. Do SnapCTL services. Oh, it doesn't depend. Space um, help. But what do you mean it does, Nishan? No, what? I'm misspeaking. I mean, okay. <laughs> SnapCTL services dash dash help. Okay. How come that doesn't work? I don't know anything about SnapCTL except that I don't like it. I think you can huh. just use. Let me see if I can restart it for you. Yeah. Well, I mean. So the answer to that question, Conrad, is no. You can run Kind anywhere you can run Docker. So Kind yeah. can run on Linux Docker. It can run on Docker Desktop if you're on a Mac. So the real question comes down to like, if you're running on Windows or Mac. The way to get to a, do a running Docker daemon, one way to do that is to use Docker Desktop. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I rebooted. I'm rebooting Docker for you, Jay. For most people, typically, most people running kind typically are, yeah, they're running it on a desktop, but like, 
for example, when you run Tanzu, kind is kind of a requirement at this point. So like there's a lot of people that run Tanzu that bootstrap it from a Linux node without any kind of desktop. <clears throat> um, and for life. So yes, yes. Thanks for the question, Conrad. So um, now we're gonna go. So I I I want to make sure that we like do some of the stuff that we talked about, and I feel like we really dove deep into this stuff. I feel like we should just pull out a little and be yeah. like, okay, we what do were, <laughs> the initial thing we were gonna talk about was post pre stop pre start hooks, all that stuff. So like, if I go back to Nishad's original problem, right? And we say, well, what was the like the what the kind of the original problem statement that the Deshad had was that we were going to was that he's got this Docker daemon, and um, the Docker daemon and the Celery process. So these these are both processes that are running inside of a pod, right? And oh, here I'm using red again. Let me get back to here. He was running these inside of a pod, and then the problem he had was that um, this Celery process. Like if he kills this, if he kills this whole thing, right? Like this Docker worker may have other things going on, right? It may have like some other stuff that's going on. And like your goal was that the celery worker was in control of when the Docker process died, right, Nishad? Uh -huh. Right, so that... But that's what we effectively want. Right now, basically what happens is the salary might be scheduling things on Docker, and then both processes get a sync up at the same time, and Docker just kills itself, and salary is like, I'm still waiting on you. This, and then it, everything fails, and then go, Bleh. Yeah. So you wanted the Docker, you wanted Docker to gracefully terminate, mm -hmm. and when it was done, whether things failed or passed, salary could gracefully terminate. Uh, so you well, wanted... We wanted Close. Docker, yeah, sorry. Go on. I was gonna say what I really wanted was I wanted Docker to term termination to wait until salary is actually done. In yeah. a lot of ways, I think the, what this came up earlier was there's a lot like a sidecar container where we want to wait until like the primary process salary is exited cleanly. Because salary will basically wait till everything's processed before exiting. But Docker is just like, I'm just gonna stop everything and then exit right now. Yeah, because it because these are receiving and the, the root cause of this is that this is these are both research those these are both rece receiving the same kill kill switch at the same time so there's so let's go over the pre-start and the post or the pre the post start and the pre-stop hooks right so before right. we before we get there though yeah sorry i just want to interrupt one more time do you remember we were looking at that calico calico process yeah so the simplest way forward is to make it so that your Docker process, your Docker container in which you are running Docker, which is a lot to say out loud. Yeah. The one where you're running Docker is running with an init process that will ignore um, the SIG hub. Mm. And the reason you want that is because it will eventually receive a SIG kill. The, this is the easiest way forward. What would happen is that point at that point both the Docker process and the Celery process would receive a hup or term, sorry, sig term. The mm. Docker process would ignore it. The um, Celery process would receive it and start cleaning up. After the period of termination grace period seconds, then everybody gets the sig kill. Okay, so the hup is so you're saying that's because the way the that's because you always get a hop like beforehand and everybody gets it right so if you get so when when it times when it comes time to kill this pod the kubelet will send a sig term to all of the containers of the pod okay and what's happening is both docker and celery are getting them at the same time and doing their good work right so docker's like okay i'm out you know and celery's mm -hmm. like wait you can't be out i'm not done yet right like <laughs> yeah and so the way to fix that is to make it so that Docker doesn't peace out when it hits the SIG term. You trap that SIG term in an init process. Okay. And then, and then the salary process, we want to receive it. So we let the salary process receive it. Salary process starts cleaning up. Termination grace period seconds means we will wait for this long before sending a kill. So we just like set a termination grace period that is 
extensive enough that we're pretty sure that celery will have a, a chance to do its work. Yeah. And then the kill happens. Docker will die. Sully should have already exited. Yeah. Although that, in our case, that sig that sig grace period is almost like three hours, which is a lot. Is it possible to to so when you send a sig kill to a process, why? I have a question. Why do you even send a sig kill? Like, can because you ignore a sig kill? Because it didn't listen to sig term. That's why. <laughs> but like at that point, I aren't already you just told killing? it once. <laughs> But so what does the kill do then? Like it like when you I've kill always me. wondered this. When I do a kill dash nine, am I like am I killing the process from the outside or is the process like imploding from the inside? So think of it, it's like a signaling thing, right? When I send sig term, I'm expecting the application to receive that signal and do and and do work. I mean, like that's it's like I said, you know, I make you know, make me a sandwich, <laughs> right? And you're in the yeah. process of making me a sandwich, and I say, actually, never mind. That's sig term, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm expecting yeah. you to stop that work. But if I yeah. say sig kill, that means that means I'm going to come and take the sandwich materials away. It's it's done now. Like we're now moving <laughs> forward with this whole sandwich <laughs> okay. idea. Like <laughs> okay, at the kernel layer, at the kernel layer, you are cut off. You are removed from the kitchen. There will be no sandwich. <laughs> okay, and is a sig kill is a sig kill always an immediate thing? Because it's not right. Because there's a kill there dash nine. Yeah, yeah. There's kill, kill. There's a few different kills. There's like kill one, kill three, kill. Mm -hmm. and, and like, so what's it's the like difference? The, the intensity with which you mean now. Oh wow. Okay. Oh really? So they're like so. The kill has like a grace period as well. I don't think it's actually seconds of grace period. Kill is like. Hold on. What is the? Kill? Let's just go to the man page for kill because I think. Because right? I remember the main difference between kill and uh, hop are basically like maskable versus non maskable. But I don't. True, really yeah. Know. yeah. What? So what? let's see. Kill and then. Doo, doo, doo. Oh, wow. Really? They don't get into it. That's surprising. Oh. Did we just reach the limits of our knowledge? Maybe try info. Requires a signal. Signal processes. I guess if somebody wants to get their PhD in Kubernetes, here's a here's your topic. This is Linux, though. <laughs> All right. I, I want you to keep looking at that while you do that. I want to pop back up and do some Kubernetes stuff because I I don't want to I don't want to not talk about the API. Um, yeah. Okay. Sig kill. I've destroyed your toys. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Please, <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, let's go. I've got this. So let's make one of these, right? So, all right. Yeah. So kill kill can send a term signal just like a regular one, and it can also send kill nine is like just do it, like die right now. So sig term, the one we were talking about before, that's like just a regular kill. Okay. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, this is this is really cool. I mean, I didn't really actually. I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know there. I always wondered what the nine versus the one <laughs> were. Here's, here's so, a great answer on uh, Stack Overflow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you? Why don't you? You all want to dump that in the uh, show notes? Uh, Nishad, you have the show notes, I think, right? Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. So. Um, all right, so what are we doing here? So we've got a um, – all right, let's go back here. So so in the life cycle of a pod, right, in the life cycle of a pod, you have – we have we have these – we have we have post start. We have, we have – you have init pods, right? So the first thing you've got is you've got these init pods. So <laughs> well, we've gone through all this life cycle stuff, right? <laughs> So like, forget about all this. Like, we're not talking about that anymore. We're now talking at a higher level where it's like, okay, before, um, before we actually start all those lower level processes, there's like these, there's the stuff that Kube does, um, as far as like or orchestrating all those processes, right? Or orchestrating the containers that are started in here, right? Because it's like each one of these 
you know, you could imagine this happening like one, two, three, whatever, however many times, right? And that's what we're going to look at now. So like, because, you know, a single pod, you may have like, you know, one init container and then you, you may have one init process and then you may have several containers in here and they're all sitting inside of this pause container. But you might have multiple init containers. So you might see this process in the scope of a single pod happening multiple times. So, okay, so you have an init pod, right? And the init pod synchronously runs before the actual pod starts, right? So the init pod runs and then the pod starts. And then once the pod starts, right? We have the we have the process inside the pod starts and then whatever its process is. And, and so actually does my pause container starts, I guess, in here, right? My init pods are all in a separate process pause names like they they have separate pause containers right and then mm -hmm. my init pod starts hopefully each one of these has a pause container that runs also right and um so then my init process so then my init pods are done and then i have a process here that starts and that process right after that starts is when the um I got some uh, some more comments in here. Sig kill. Thanks, Bugden. Um, so um, and Choco. Man seven signal. There's a signal table there. Oh, nice. Okay. So uh, after that process, um, we have our post start. Okay. And then you have some time period that goes on, your container's doing stuff, and then after that, we've got our pre-stop. So this is the thing, so this is kind of the thing that Nishad was talking about, right? Like, um, so what is the use case for this? So, so the pre-stop is, I've, is it like, I guess there, so there's no guarantee here that this pre-stop will complete before the, or is there, there is no guarantee. So, okay. So there's no guarantee. So this is the problem that Nishad has. So if there was a guarantee. Hmm. I don't, I'm not even sure still at that point that it would. Yeah. It still wouldn't solve that problem. No. Uh, basically what happens is like, um, I think basically what happens is it's, You'll start send a pre-stop signal, start timer, send the pre-stop, and then when pre and then if by the time pre-stop isn't done, it'll just send the sig kill. Uh, and the problem I have here is you because the uh, celery process doesn't actually expose an API endpoint, there's no easy way to tell when celery is exited. Uh, and use that information and basically use that information to block the exit of the Docker daemon. Well, even if Celery did expose an, oh, I see. Because you could just curl it. And because this pre-stop, I think, from what I remember, is blocking. So it'll block sending the SIG term until this pre-stop hook completes. Really? Is it permanently blocking? No, until the grace until the grace period timeout. OK, so this is when your pod grace period takes place. I think so. It's been a while. Duffy, is that true? What was the question? Is the pod grace period activated at this pre-stop boundary? So, like, as soon as my pre-stop starts, that's when the pod pod uh, that's when the pod um, grace periods started, or does it start after? I guess so the question is this: Is it like so? The, pre the, the grace period starts once it receives the once it receives the kill. Oh, but does that mean the pre-stop can block forever? I think... I think the reason there's no guarantee is because your grace period is still in effect. So, like, your pre-stop code can run, but you still only have the remainder of, like, 600 seconds to get it done. Well, we can do this. We can find out, right? We can do do... Can we just do while... So, we'll... We could do an experiment, right? Sleep one, 
Echo, Rashad, done, right? So there's so one hypothesis here is that this pod would never die. I'm sure that's not true though, right? Well, it'll definitely die. Like I'm I'm pretty sure my theory of operation is that it would be like when you hit it when you set, when it hits the first when it first when it hits the first interrupt, the grace period starts. And you have until that long before you receive the kill. Regardless of what's happening with this pre-stop stuff at all. It doesn't interject. Pre-stop will just happen like as soon as the as soon as the int happens, but the int is still but the but the um the grace period seconds are still counting. That's what I think is happening. Okay. But then wouldn't that be called post stop or like just I, I don't know. Pre-stop oh. implies to me that it must run before the stop is signal sent. Is it are we talking about post stop though? Uh, no, this is pre-stop. We're pre-stop. Oh, I'm sorry. Pre-stop post. <laughs> it's so confusing. Wait, is is there a post-stop? I thought there was only pre. -stop. You're right. Yeah, I had a backwards. Hold on one second. Let me, let's just go back to the doc. Let me do that for a second. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Pre-stop. <sighs> pre-stop. You know that this stuff is tough when like Duffy's here and we're still getting lost. Oh, okay. Thanks. Here we go. Stop. Ah, how do I make the thing, Nishad, go in the right place? Here it is. Okay. Pre post start, pre stop. There is no post stop. But okay. pre stop, this hook is called immediately before a container is terminated due to an API request or a management event like a liveness or startup probe failure. A call so, to pre stop. Hook yeah, fails if the container is already terminated or a completed state. The hook must complete before the term signal to stop the container can be sent. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah, you're right. This does interject before that. The pod's termination grace period countdown begins before the pre-stop hook is executed. So, weirdly, we're both right. Mm -hmm. So regardless of the outcome of the handler, the container will eventually terminate within the pod's termination grace period. So you can, so basically that's wild. Okay, so so the house of cards is you have a running container, you have a pre-stop hook defined. The pre-stop hook code is sent, whatever you like defined there, is sent. Then the sig term is sent. And the clock okay. starts for grace period. You have the period of the grace period to get through that pre-stop code or pre-stop code. If you overrun it, you're still dying at the end of the termination grace period. So the sig kill happens after the pre-stop. Mm -hmm. Well, after and the grace not the pre -stop, after the after grace, grace period. period. Yeah. The sig term, the sig term hop happens here. Yeah. Sig term happens here. Yeah, sig term. So pre stop code initted, sig term is sent, period of grace period, then sig kill. But you'll notice that we're not like waiting for the pre stop to be successful. We're waiting until the end of the grace period. Yeah, so these are all lined up here. The end of the grace period is lined up with the beginning of the sig kill. And some arbitrary, or no, but sig term is sent after pre stop. Yes. Okay, that's the key thing. Okay. So, no. yeah. I need a second here. Just give me a second, Nishad. I just got to. You have 600 I... seconds by default. <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> or, is it, or is it 300? I can't remember. This is a good you made a Kubernetes joke. Oh, this is we intense. Have to say afterwards. <laughs> you, you, made, you made a kill Jay and a Kubernetes joke all in the same day, y'all. All right. Why won't this schedule kubectl get pods dash a kubectl describe pod? Why isn't it? Why is it pending? I don't see anything here, Nishad. Uh, do you keep going to events? This is weird. Is something horribly wrong with my cluster? Is this because I... 
Do you oh, want to no. run this on the um, run this on the other VM, the Azure VM, on the TKG cluster? I want to see if we can figure this out. Yeah, we could run it there too. I mean, I'm in a team act. If you want to try to run it there, you could race me. Coop CTL get pods. Let's see if I can um, figure out team act fast, then you can figure out what's wrong with this one. <laughs> So, Tmux A. Yes, I can Wait. do that. You remove the comment graphic. The StreamYard uh, thing, is that what you're talking about, this, Eric? No, no, this is very meta. He's actually talking about <laughs> He's actually talking about the comment that is currently covering the bottom of the terminal, which is him complaining about the comment graphic that is covering <laughs> oh. the, oh, the bottom oh, okay. of the <laughs> Well, that was weird. Oh, um, so this is like the so just, this is one of the so weirdest day Eric, of my life. Hide Eric's comment, please. Okay, here we go. So now let me just not be at the bottom of the terminal. How about that? That also works. Let's give a little space so that our friends can say stuff and be on the internet with us. Hold on a second. All right, let's. Here we go. Here we go, Eric. Eric, you you showed up like. Tw You've been at the last three TGIKs. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you, man. Okay. Oh. So Friedrich's here too. And Friedrich's always here. Friedrich's my friend. Me and him just did a KubeCon talk today. Um, so where are we at? So um, why is it pending? Who wants to tell me why? I, why it shouldn't, shouldn't we get a KubeCTL get events? Something really bad is happening because it's not even giving us a. Why would it be pending? Kettle get, keep kettle get nodes. Is everything running? Is the API server and everything else running? Yeah. And the nodes are happy. I've never, this is like, I've never keep seen kettle, not been do keep, keep kettle describe of that pod. Oops, what am you I doing? Describe here? pod. CTL describe pod. There we go. Yeah, there's nothing in here. <laughs> Neat. Isn't there normally like scheduling information and stuff? Like mm -hmm. why normally the scheduler would give us like a histogram, right? It does look like it does look like either your controller manager or your scheduler is out to lunch. Yeah, it's like the controller manager is not running, right? kubectl get pods dash a. We have to kill it. Nothing's even complaining right now. So let's do the same thing with the. Um, if this is running in a kind cluster, if this is running in a um, a kubeadm based cluster, then that just had no effect. Um, why is that? Killing, you can't kill the, what's the kind cluster? We're on the left here. The, in fact, all of our clusters are kind today. These so are all running as, as pods. Yeah. Because they're static pods though, like they don't actually, you can't control them from the control plane. You can only control them from the underlying node. So you'd have to go in, you have Docker exec in there and then like move that stuff out of manifest and put it back. Oh, so that's like a shadow pod or what do you call those things? Mirror pod, yeah. That's a mirror pod. So when you kill a mirror pod, it doesn't. A uh, damn thing happens. Yeah, it just makes you feel better about yeah, yourself. Yeah, you're right. Because really you can. In the background. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I got you. Okay, cool. So let's Docker. Yes. Now I need to figure out which one of these is my control plane node. I guess this one. There. Why do I have an Antria cluster on here? Okay, Docker, exec, sh. I have an Antre and a Calico cluster on here, I guess. Um, now I go to um, CD, Etsy, then bash. CD, what is it? Etsy, Kubernetes, manifests, then kube controller manager. Oh, okay. So we'll just do move kube controller manager temp and that'll restart it, right? And I can move it back, right? Yeah. So, 
Well, oh, bye, 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 bye. hold on. Before you move it back, just do Sierra Kettle PS. You should see the controller manager is no longer running. Yeah. You see now it's even. Now, now, are we? Is this Liggett's bug that we're about to reproduce? Except we're on one twenty one, so maybe we won't. See. <laughs> exactly. Controller manager is back up. Okay, so now let's see if we scheduled. So if anybody has questions about what we just did, free, feel free to ask. Like I know we kind of went fast. Well, it's weird to say, both look, they both look like they're running. So that's that's what's throwing me. Like there must be something else happening. Well, we did do that weird thing where we restarted our VM. I mean, but this is just really interesting, right? Like, how is it? Yeah, you're on the bottom of the screen again. Uh oh. Scoop CTR. This is on the internet. What did he say? Oh, yeah. It's not DNS. Okay. It isn't this time. It's not. For once, okay. Something's wait. Did it say? I I think I saw the word unhealthy, Nishad. Oh, you did. Yeah, I'm seeing it occasionally, but see. Oh, right. That would be good. It's the calico control. Oh, calico right? node is down. So oh, why would that oh, cause yeah. any? That but, was half an hour ago, though. But that should yeah, make the node unhealthy. Yeah, and that wouldn't cause us not... Everything's running on host network here and talking to the API server over host network anyways, so why would that... Well, that's not true, right? Your pod that you created was supposed to be in the overlay network, wasn't it? Well, the uh, yeah, the pod, but like we didn't see the scheduler. Like we didn't... It's not like we saw the scheduler saying, I can't schedule this because oh, yeah, there's are, no nodes running. Those ready, are host right? net, yeah. Yeah. Um, the overlay is unhealthy. What I've seen is it just starts, what, erroring out during pod creation? Yeah, you would see something, yeah. So we have a situation where if the only way I can think of is if we go in and actually looked at the schedule. Okay, we're not going to do that. So, Kindly cluster, do, kindly okay. cluster. So I guess we should ask our friends here. Do you all want to like move on with this pre-stop thing or do you want to see what's wrong with this cluster that's in the weirdest state that I've ever seen a cluster in my entire life? Where we created a pod and it's pending and nothing is complaining about why it can't schedule it. I don't think anybody cares. I don't know though. Maybe somebody does. I totally, I'm whatever. Okay, so let's start doing the other thing. And if people are like, I want to see its cattle, Eric wins again. Oh, Eric, you're at the bottom. We're doing that meta thing again where like, okay, let me move this back up to the top. You know, it's just like instinct, you know, that weird instinct you have to use all your screen real estate. Okay. Like when you move move into a directory and you type ls, even though you don't really care what's in that directory. I yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, can everybody see everything okay? A lot of times I, on TGIK, whenever I do these, like people can't see stuff because I make my... Okay. So let's kill it. Let's kill everything. Kind. Just get. use the other cluster, Jay. It'll be faster. Okay. We're in here. Yeah. All right. I already created the deployment on it. Beat me. Oh, are we in different clusters? Well, how, which one uh, how, what cluster would I be in that you're not in? No, that <laughs> what other cluster could we possibly be sharing? Uh, I think the, I don't think it's that we're in different clusters. I think it's that you're in the wrong cluster, Nishad. Because uh, I definitely can see the pod running. You did wrong. Uh, Wait, what? That's neat. Uh huh. Um, kind get clusters. Yeah, Faye, we're gonna make it big. We can make it big for you, Faye. Here we go. It's a case of mistaken identity. That's because Faye's probably working on stuff. He's probably working and watching at the same time, and he's got me tucked away in some small little weird mm -hmm. window on the corner of his... Okay. <laughs> okay. Faye. Faye can do it next with us. Faye, you're going to do one of these with us one of these days. All right. So... Um, my terminal's slow today. 
All right, kind get clusters. You might like kind. my that on your iPod. See, he's oh, on his iPod. iPad. He's watching us on his iPhone or his iPad or something. He's we're off to the side. Buffy, what's your background? What is that? Oh, it's a. It's a live Im It's a GIF. It's like a perfect loop, and it has like a kind of a forest thing. I found it on the um, public domain website. I think I can't remember where I found it. But it has like fog that's rolling by behind me. It's kind of fun. I like it. Is the fog moving? I don't see it moving. I don't know. It's hard to see it, but like if you look over my shoulder and like over here, you can kind of see it moving like over there. Oh, okay. You have to look. I have to look a little closer. I got you in a small window, just like Faye has me in a small. Oh, window. I see. All right. Okay. It's cool. All right. So nothing's up. Good. All right. So now I'm going to go to my my favorite. I have this thing. I have my hey, that's prototypes, CD kind. Find local up. All right. So we have this repo that we maintain for folks who want to play at home. It's here. You can go here and you just do kind local up and you can run Antria. You can run Cilium if you want to make Duffy happy or you can run Calico. You can run any of these three CNIs and just create a kind yeah, of cluster. I have Cilium in there. That's cool. Yeah, we do have Cilium in here. You know who put it in there? Amin put it in there. I don't know if he's here though. I think he left. See, look at this. Amin put it in there eight months ago. Well, mean. Okay. This is how we're doing Cilium. If there's something wrong with us, let us know. We do Helm, Cilium, install. Sounds right. Yep. Okay. So um, anyways, yeah. So it's just like a one. You can just do like CNI equals Cilium in the beginning here. So I just use this anytime I'm making a kind cluster so that I can have a CNI on it. Otherwise, you always run into this weird thing where you run a kind cluster and you do some stuff and you're like, oh, I wish I had a real network. And then you have to go install Although I will stop and give a shout out to uh, KindNet because it is constantly improving. In fact, now um, KindNet has, uh, by default, KindNet will run in dual stack mode. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty cool. KindNet, by the way, is the default CNI for um, Kind. That's, yeah. that's the name, I suppose. Yeah, that's Antonio's thing, right? Yeah. So there is a pretty good CNI in there for just doing basic testing. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need. Yeah. I, I just need it for network policy stuff. But yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you don't really need a real CNI for most stuff that people do with kind. Does it work? Multi-node networking and all that stuff works with KindNet? Like services. networking. Load, like, coup proxy tests will pass and service test like. Networking yes. between from one pod to another across nodes and stuff, it all works. Okay. Um, all right, so now our cluster is coming up. All right, here we go. Okay. Now let's try to do the same thing. Let's get out of here. Okay. And let's do kubectl create dash f. We're going to try to run this lifecycle thing again and see what we can. Okay. Kubectl get pods dash a. Let's see if it pulls down. So at least it's at least it's pulling it down this time. And as you all recall, we made it so that it basically sits around for like an infinitely long period of time. Okay, so it's pulling in GenX. I hope we are not running, running. into um it's I hope running. that running. it's running. Okay, cool. So now we do kubectl. So we should probably get the kubelet logs, right? We want to see the kubelet logs, I assume, while we do this, right? So if I do Docker PS, um, 
How do I find out what node it's running on? Kubectl get pods dash o wide. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find out what node this is running on, and then after I find that out, get. <laughs> after I find that out, Docker ps Docker exec. I'm going to jump into the node that this is running on, which is Calico Worker Two. Here. I'm going to open a shell up bin bash and then i'm going to do journal ctl dash what is it f dash u kubla oh, right flu it's flu -L -U. yeah okay you know why it's flu no follow line wrap unit can you put that in the show notes nishad coop ctl flu that's follow line wrap unit Here we go. Hey, what's up, Balzas? 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 Um, a meme's still here. I mean, we just were. <laughs> when are you going to add port ranges, Duffy? What? When are you going to put port ranges into Cilium? Ricardo Ooh, will be so happy if you do that. Because we can graduate the, the port range feature. Have you heard about that issue? The port range feature. So range. you were talking Ricard about like policy, right? Network policies, yeah. So, so there was a port range feature that we added to the network policy API, and it's still beta. And um, we, if we can get one more CNI to adopt the port range. Uh, feature, then we can graduate that to GA. And I think what Ricardo want, is asking is whether Cilium can add those. Because I don't think Oven Kubernetes can do it. Calico and Antria both do it, though. Just totally off topic. That's a good question. Is there already an issue open against Cilium for that? Ricardo, if there's an issue, you can link us to it. Maybe we can dig into it a little. But um, What's getting kind of late in the show, though, but uh, yeah. So let's do this. Let's do kubectl delete pod lifecycle demo, and let's see what the kubelet does. So I'm deleting it, and now we're waiting. Okay, we're waiting. It's 5.23. We're still waiting. So what's going on? I would feel like the shouldn't the kubelet have said, like, hey, the clock is ticking. Is it like the log level's too low or something? Yeah, that might be it. Hmm. That's interesting. So let's see. Okay. Nodes topology is not available. Providing CPU topology. Pod container deleter. Inner projected. Teardown succeeded for volume. Okay. It succeeded. Volume detached for volume. That's the service account thing, right? But the, your pod is called lifecycle demo, right? So just do a grip for lifecycle demo. Yeah. Let's make this full screen. What's this? This is it complaining that it can't find a container to delete. Probably because it's already been deleted. Pre stop hook failed. There it is. So the so this exited with the one thirty seven. What's the exit code one thirty seven? So what we tried to do is we tried to do an init. Um, we tried to do an infinite loop inside of a pre stop. And what is it? What is a one thirty seven? Is it because I have a typo in my bash script? Probably. It's probably something to do with grace period. Yeah. But I don't know. So, okay. So, all right. So I think we've got five minutes left. I want to make sure we at least briefly talk about some of the other things that we sort of brought up for this, for this, sort of this. Um, so the, the uh, originally we were going to look into C groups hooks. So we definitely got to cover the hook stuff. I wanted to talk just really quickly about runtime classes um because there's like the 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 
So runtime classes. Also, yeah, yeah um, I it. it's out of memory. As just what um, Nicholas Davis. Uh, wait, uh, out of memory. Why? Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> that. Why would a pre-stop hook run out of memory? I don't know, but if you Google bash uh, 137, that's what it hits. I wonder it's if that's also, because, yeah, go on. I thought it was, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I thought that, I thought that 137 was indicative of, of having received a SIG kill, not necessarily, like most frequently you receive a SIG kill because of OOM. Um. Okay. I mean, that would make the most sense because what we're expecting uh -huh. is that thing would run for infinity and then it would finally get killed. So that's probably what, what happened then. Um, yeah. So so we're expecting that 137 to be the SIG kill. Um, so runtime classes, um, they solve this fundamental problem of like you've got a pod. The pod needs knows how it needs to run. Um, and there's like you could do a thing with taints and tolerations where you modify the nodes in your cluster or you could just define, um, you could define a runtime class, right? And then when you define the runtime class, um, it'll 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 wind up triggering this handler. And for example, this is important for Windows, right? We can have a Windows runtime class. You can have a, another runtime class, right? And the reason I thought this was kind of worth mentioning is that like um, this kind of goes down to the CRI implement implementation that you have, and then um, if you if you actually look around in the keps that are that are like being there's a there's a kep out there for for sig windows from from ravi um i'm going to try to pull it up um um where is it where is it Yeah, so actually I'll show you first I'm going to show you something else. If you go to if you jump into if you jump into actually I have an issue I filed about this cuz I was really confused about it at one point. So, um when I was first running containers on Windows a long time ago, I was really confused about this um because your runtime class for for example, you know, it, it, it it's actually there's a name for the runtime class that's actually hard coded into container D for Windows um, at, by default, which is config config Windows Go. So you know that's the container D. This this stuff gets past that low into the into the container runtime, right? So um, you, your your container runtime, your CRI, you know, it, container D then will see this and it'll say, oh, I need to run this as like a Windows process, right? And then it'll go trigger the right windows container D thing to start your, start your container. Right. So like, that's this whole thing up here, this whole thing that we were drawing earlier that I, I don't know why, I don't know why we X this out, but this is like the runtime class information from over here. When you start a pod gets sort of plumbed in all the way down to the container runtime itself, and then it can decide how to run it. And that's kind of the future of how we'll be doing multi OS, you know, Kubernetes like scheduling and stuff. Um, so that was like one of the things that I thought was kind of related to this that we should look into. Um, and so I guess I think that's kind of good because at least we got to go through these two. We didn't really get to do much on C groups, um, but like what's the simplest way to show them some C groups? We can go into, if any of y'all have done this, it's kind of an interesting thing to do. You can go, it's under run, right? Duffy run. What are you trying to prove? C groups. I want to show them the C groups that are made for our. The best way to do that, would, in my opinion, is if you identify a process that's containerized and you look at uh, ls slash proc the pit of that process in the root file system in the root node slash. Um, uh, like here's one. Where's where? Here's one. Right. Here's a container. Right. Yeah, like that runs for bird one. Right? Yeah. So if you do ls proc. One five six nine. One five six nine. Can you hide Ricardo's comment, please? Oh my God, I'm still at the bottom. Yes. yes. Here we go. How's that? LS slash proc. Okay. 
on 569. Yeah, so these are, yeah, here we go. So inside of these, these are, these are not actually directories, they're like memory mapped directories or whatever. But inside of these, inside your proc directory, yeah, go on. And, and then out, and then uh, C group, so proc 1569 C group. Enter. Oh, maybe that's not what I wanted. What is it? It's, um, where is there it, it is, nope. right? No, that's not it. Go back, do ls minus slash. And then just do the 1569 for a second. There's another folder in here that I'm looking for. NS, that's what it is. So, And inside it there is going to be our memory C groups and our CPU. That will, there we go. And then if you do LS minus AL inside of here. So this is the mapping yeah, there we go. for this process for each of the namespaces that is associated for this process. So the C group namespace that this process is associated with is 4026531835. The IPC namespace that is associated, the mount namespace, and that all of those are here. But if you were to do that same command for PID1, just before changing, like do ls minus l proc 1 and s, and you can see that those numbers are different. Not in every case, but in some of them, right? So, why why, why do we why are we comparing it to one? <laughs> That's an interesting choice. Because the one process, the first process one, is not containerized from the perspective of the C group associated with this container. But the other process, the run C process, the run serve process, is containerized. Is so yeah, but it would be different than any container, right? Well, like if I containers in the same pod. Like if I did, if they're in the same pod. They'll have uh, the same net NS. They'll have the same. They'll all be associated with the same C group because right now, in, right now, um, they're all part of the same root C group. So if you do system D, system system D CGLS, you'll be able to see all of the C groups that are. Here's defined. one one fifty. There, I mean, it would be different than any. Mm -mm. This is the this is the artifact of a container. The fact that you have a containerized process is the only reason why all of these are different. Yeah. If you were to do uh, if you were to look at like you know if you were to do ls minus l for the for your pid it would be dollar sign dollar sign, then that would be yours and you would have the same mapping as the root. That will match what's in pid one. Uh, yep, these are the same. Yeah. So wouldn't containers in the same pod have different like pit namespaces, for example? If it's multiple containers within the same pod, yes, the pit namespace will be unique. Unless you have your host shared or your pod shared pit okay. and S thing. So um, wait, now if we go in here. So so one, one more command that I think will help you is if you do systemd dash CGLS, I think it's probably closer to what you were looking for before. I'm sorry to get on this path. But. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I'm looking for this. Yeah, the thing that has like the CPU and the memory definitions in it. Yeah, do systemd dash CGLS. Nope, all one word. Also, I found that interesting, so thank you. Yeah. So so this, I think, yeah, I think that, that this is actually all very interesting. So this is the, these are the C groups that have been defined underneath the root C group for this whole uh, node. So each of these things off of this trunk are, have their own C group. And so at the moment, the important part is that there's like a system slice. And then down below that, each of these things will have their own C group associated or wherever the parent uh, C group is. And I'm just going to draw something. Why is this a systemd command? Why what? Oh, yeah, Why that's a good question. Matter? Yeah, that's because systemd is actually its own operating system. No, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm only mostly kidding. It's wild. So systemd, yeah, it it's all right. So you, yeah, I, I was wor uh, very wary of kicking that anthill, but. Up. I'm a run toward kind of guy. All right. So <laughs> when I start up, this is my whole pie, right? And yeah. then is it systemd owns all this, right? PID1 owns well, all this, actually, right? Well, actually, 
What what are you talking about from the C group perspective, like the actual capacity for like CPU and memory and that stuff? Yeah, like let's just say for memory, right? Okay, so this because this is where things get weird because it, de it really does depend. Oh and I hate no! That, but yeah, <laughs> it's true. So okay. let's take the cubelet. Let's take the cubelet for example here, right? Yeah. You have a choice when you're configuring uh, Docker and also when you're configuring the cubelet. And your choice is between allowing system D to be the um, to be the thing that doles out C groups, or allowing or or creating your own under C group FS. And both of these are configurable both at Docker and also at the Kubelet. But it's oh wait, I, they agree. didn't they just deprecate that though? <laughs> like this week? Nah, no, no okay. way. There's no way. Thought, that. Okay, all right, okay, okay. There's something happened shocked. where. Well, because Perry was like doing, we just like, he just changed this in our dev environments. And I was like, I don't know why he did this, but maybe it was just because it was deprecated. But I just remember, I just remember seeing Perry just, what did he do? He changed he it to moved C you toward, probably moved you toward system D. Oh, wait, no, he moved you toward what? I don't know why he did that. He was fixing something, but I don't know what he was fixing. Oh, maybe that's because our Linux node is still running Docker or something. I don't know. Okay. Never mind. Sorry for the context switch. So keep going. This is, this is a bad scene. Okay. But here, um, the reason I'm nervous about that is because, so this is an interesting thing that was a problem in Kubadium for a while where like we were trying to figure out what the right thing to default to was. Yeah. It's important that like your Kubelet and your Docker agree on, on what the C group, um, controller is like what you're what you're using to allocate C groups for um, containers is R. And by Docker you mean like kubelet and container D. Kubelet and container D, kubelet and Docker, whatever you're using for container runtime, it has to agree with what the kubelet is doing. Yeah. Uh, or I should say the kubelet has to agree with what the container runtime is doing because container runtime is lower level. Yeah. So but to that point, like if you do system CD, if you do system D dash CGLS mm -hmm. and you're looking at one that's using C group FS, you will see a whole different uh, root C group that's been defined as C group, of, uh, C group FS. And that will be what you allocate C group uh, content from. And then the thing that's weird there is that now system D thinks it has a root C group and C group FS thinks that it has the root C group. And so effectively they're both trying to allocate the resources that are available for the whole system. And they're not working together. There's no like balancing of those two. So if you have- But they're both using the same ledger though, right? Not really. Like they no. both think they're the root. System D thinks it's the root and C group of S thinks it's the root. But are they both so, reading the data from the same Etsy? Yeah, they're both operating on the, on the same the real same. root. The same slash run or whatever the allocations are written to, right? But they're but they're effectively like a fork in the road very early in the process. So now both of those two think that they're the root. Uh -huh. So if you think about it, like say I have 10 gig of memory. Yeah. If you're operating as though you are the root C group, then you're thinking that you can allocate all of that 10 gig. That's on you to allocate that. If there are two entities that think they're both the root C group, then both of them will think, oh, I, I got 10 gig. Mm -hmm. If only one C group controller exists and that one is system D, then system D is right. It's the one. It can it can allocate that entire 10 gig and C group FS won't mess that up. But if they differ, then you can run into weird problems. But where because, does it like, where is the truth of how much free memory there is? Like as soon as system D allocates a process, isn't C group FS? going to be bound to the truth of what was allocated. Like, so in this case, if I have this pie here and if system D allocates this much of it, even though these, they don't talk, they don't like each other. C group right. FS over here. Let's make him won't, different color. won't be able to see it because it's sitting, it's, it's, it, it, it won't understand how much has been allocated to system D. Okay. Yeah, but C group just allocated this to a process. This is PID ten. But, but that process is under a different branch in the tree that C, that C group FS does not control. But can it see it? 
Can it see that this chunk is gone? No, because from from the perspective of from the perspective of the Seeker FS controller, it thinks it's responsible for allocating all of that space. It's not going to go over to another controller and say, "How much did you use?" Right? This is more like a provisioner model, right? Where like you're saying, when you created that pod, you said, "Give this thing two gig of memory," mm -hmm. and the C group controller is like, "Got it, two gig of memory. That's what's in there." And the and the kernel above it is like, "Well, when that namespace was created, that was using two gig of memory." It doesn't right. care that there's another controller that's actually also allocating memory. That's oversubscription. That's not. That's, it doesn't care at all if that's happening. It's not a problem. Okay. So, is it fair to think of them as just like having two admissions controllers, and neither of them is aware of the other? Like. And the, yeah, exactly. Wow, I didn't know that. So you could. So it's totally fine. So we're totally fine oversubscribing any resource well, that's constrained. Cons in, <laughs> any, in, any, in, yeah. In in that, as long as they don't conflict, like as long as they don't have a hard conflict, then you're fine. But if you like, but if you like over allocate things, and the um killer has to come along and clean stuff up for you, what decision does it make? Which one does it follow? System D or secret vest? Which one's right? If there are two. Things could get weird, you know, like. I mean, with memory, there's a very specific allocation that's happening. It's like a physical block of stuff that's like locked. I thought the kernel. I mean, couldn't you. Like when it's allocating memory, isn't it actually allocating a specific part of the memory, like a contiguous. Like, so like this is this isn't memory allocation. This is the this is your ability to control how much memory is allocated for a process when that process requests. Memory. So the thing that's allocating won't. So you're not going to get corrupt allocation because of this. You're only going to get oversubscription. Yeah, like I think the point that that's happening here is basically the kernel isn't enforcing that two C groups don't have overlapping allocations. It's yeah, that's just right. Being, yeah, that's, yeah. Like it's it, it enforced at the C group uh, by whoever's own manages C group. You could just make yeah. So C groups are totally external to the kernel's internal accounting system, whatever that thing is. And I guess yeah. that's because they're because added because afterwards of, as like well, a thing. Because this isn't memory allocation. This is this is memory limit, right? This is like how much memory a process can use before it should be reaped. Yeah. Right. This is like this is quota, not consumption. But I'm yeah. I'm really surprised the decision is made not to have the kernel handle the quota hard, like quota limits. And you kind of get that for free if you pick one. Hmm. But if you pick two, well, not so, so much. In our actual machine over <laughs> here, what? How can we test whether we have whether we're actually do, running? C yeah, you can do uh, system D CGLS. System D CGLS. Uh, dash. With no space, and then you see the continuity process, and yeah. you see. Uh... Scroll down a bit. Actually, that does look interesting. Actually, can you do Docker PS or Docker info? Something is weird here. There should be a kind note on this one. Let's scroll up a little bit. On the Docker info, so it should it should tell you what's what it's using for C group. It should say C group two, and then the C group driver. Yeah, you're using C group of S here, and you're okay. using C groups v one. Okay, that's what it looked like. Because so, you have like this Docker like up at the high peak. Okay, so we have C yeah. groups for okay, so we had so we are using C group FS for Docker and then we're using okay. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> and it looked like from the change that Perry made that you decided just to go with that instead of picking system D as your as, your C group. as a driver, as a dry, as a C group driver for the Docker, yeah. But yeah. the right default, thing to do, yeah. yeah. By default, Docker um, does use C group FS. Oh, it does. Okay, it doesn't use System D by default. But in production, 
I, I highly recommend. The yeah, system. Yeah. The one. Yeah. Yeah, system because otherwise you have two accounting systems. Yeah. So yeah, in general, it's probably good homework assignment for folks that are watching this. Just make sure you're not running C Group FS. <laughs> otherwise. You know, it kind of reminds me, I've seen like in production clusters, a lot of um killing and I never knew why. And I'm kind of wondering whether that might've been part of what was going on, probably, but those are also running. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're out of time cause we've been going for a while. Um, Sorry. let me go back and see if there's any questions. Oh God, we got a lot of questions. Um, oh. is system D the future of con container orchestration? Ha <laughs> ha. How's Sorry. that? Yeah. <laughs> Even though I'm Isn't a run for kind of guy, big... I'm still not going to answer that question. <laughs> so it's wasn't it all built by Facebook and all that and, and Red Hat and everything before any of this? And so like you, you could have just used Wait. it. Are you thinking of fleet? I mean, you could have just built all this stuff directly on top of system D, right? Could you have just built the kubelet on top of directly on top of system D? I mean, that's effectively what fleet was like fleet was like mm -hmm. distributed system D. Yeah. A F that, was a, that, was a, that was a core OS project, by the way. Okay. That's what fleet was. Okay. Don't challenge partnering, please. <laughs> He's the guy who made system D, right? Yeah. If our if our our kubelet doesn't even start if a different you start if using a different C group driver than the container runtime yeah okay that's true I didn't actually. know that I didn't know that Bogdan that's cool um yeah. he gets real mad at you did we lose any other okay we got everything hi Nicholas cool I think this is all right. So anything else you all want to say before we end this TGIK? Thank you all. It's mm -hmm. been fun being back on TGIK. It's been a while. It's good seeing you, Duff. Thanks so much. We would I would have been like fumbling around inside of that run directory trying to figure out where my memory, memory directories and all that were if it wasn't for you. So I, I really appreciate you teaching us all this stuff today, man. Mm -hmm. and, and so... All right. Thanks, Nishad, for coming to hang out for your first TGIK. And we'll see you all next time. Good, good.